Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Peter Gerges. He's a professor of organismic and evolutionary biology at Harvard University. We're going to talk about uh, various issues surrounding that. So, uh, Peter, thanks for coming. Well, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah. Well, tell me about your work. What's the research about? Well, as you mentioned, so I'm on the faculty here at Harvard University. My lab really focuses on understanding how our planet's biosphere uh, runs. Uh, In particular, the contribution of the ocean to making our planet habitable. You and I get up in the morning and there's oxygen in the air uh, and the sun is shining. And, you know, there's sometimes there's rain and, you know, we turn our faucets on and water comes out and all of that happens and we depend on it. And we don't often take the time as even even me, even though I study this for a living, we don't often take the time to stop and say, well, how did this all come to pass? So in my lab, we study the microbes and animals that live in the ocean, in particular, the microbes and the role that they play. in keeping our planet healthy, making oxygen available. In my lab, we primarily study microbes that interact with metals, you know, iron and magnesium and things like that, that are a huge part of keeping our ocean healthy, believe it or not. it's They're kind of like the multivitamins of the ocean, right? Everything oh. needs a little bit of these metals, um, just like we do, to keep our body healthy. And microbes play a huge role in making that happen. That's what we do. So do you study the bacteria or the viruses, the phages that, that prey upon the bacteria or all of it? Or what, what's great, your, great. is there a focus? Yeah, great question. So uh, we primarily study bacteria as well as organisms called archaea. They're microbes that weren't really recognized for a long time because, you know, when you look at a microbe under a microscope, it's a little round dot for the most part. You know, some form chains and things like this. But there are two different kinds of microorganisms that are really abundant in our world. You know, Rich, one of the things that is hard to remember is just how many of them there are. There's uh, in the ocean about 10 to the 27th, right? 10 to the power of 27. And that's a big number. 10 to the power of nine is a billion. 10 to the power of 12, power of 12 is a trillion. 10 to the 27th. And there are so many of them um, that, you know, if we strung them end on end like pearls on a necklace, they would stretch across our galaxy. Literally, 100 and, 105,000 light years of microbes. Now, most microbes on Earth are playing some role in helping the planet run. They're not human pathogens. There's maybe like a couple of hundred that hurt people at most. And of the millions and billions and trillions of other microbes, they keep our 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 planet running. So we study those organisms and we study the animals that associate with them. Well, there's a lot to study. I mean, what is your focus? Uh, I'm sure there's a few subjects creatures or certain microbes or parts of the ocean that you study? Like, how do you uh, narrow it down? Yeah, great question. The uh, A lot of what we focus on are those environments in the deep ocean that are putting metals and other kinds of molecules into the water. So those are things like hydrothermal vents, which are the underwater hot springs, as well as uh, methane seeps. Now, believe it or not, there are a lot of places in our ocean where uh, methane and other gases are just naturally occurring, and oil is naturally occurring and seeping out of the seafloor. Now, these are not bad. They're not the same as a big oil spill. But the microbes that live there and the animals that live there are typically doing really amazing things like making a living off of these oils and off of these metals. For example, at hydrothermal vents, there are a lot of microbes that make a living off of this molecule called hydrogen sulfide, which is that rotten egg smell that comes out of sewers. And for most animals, that stuff is toxic. It's more toxic than cyanide. And yet, microbes and the animals that they partner with have found a way to take that toxic chemical and use it to harness energy. So they actually make a living off of these chemicals, almost independent of sunlight. 
Yeah, you know, it's weird that, um, I don't know, the trading of energies held by, you know, uh, the various bonds and molecules is like the currency of, of all life, it seems like. It's really weird, you know, like in, inside of uh, our cells, you know, the Krebs cycle, it's, it seems just like an interplay of different electron energies. It's, it's weird. It's really weird. Absolutely. So, so you were asking me specifically what we focus on. Well, those are the sites we study. Yep. But what we specifically really care about is how matter and energy flow through our biosphere. Now, we know, and many of us have heard, um, that you know, matter is neither, and energy is neither destroyed nor created, right? Scientists who studied this know this intimately, but, but even those of us who aren't scientists on a day-to-day -day basis may have heard this before. Well, it's true. But what organisms do is they find ways to move energy from the world around them, to harness it, and to do work. Uh, and you're, you mentioned the Krebs cycle, right? So whenever we sit down and eat, we're taking, we're taking in um, organic matter. And I don't mean, you know, organic in the way that fancy grocery stores do. I mean, stuff that other organisms have produced, and we eat it, and we, we basically burn it with oxygen. And that reaction yields energy that we can harness to build our cells again, to grow our bones, to have children, to, you know, wield a hammer, you name it. That's how our biosphere runs, right? So a lot of what we do, Rich, is we ask, what microbes are playing a role in moving matter and energy from the abiotic world, from rocks and chemicals into the biological world? That is the focus of our work. Uh, okay. Is there a name for the, um, the bacteria or the creatures that first start with the raw material? And then was the success successively uh, work on it? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, we scientists love to give names to everything because it helps us understand uh, and kind of categorize creatures. Now, there are we're, we're familiar, almost all people are with plants and plants harness energy from the sun and they use that to convert carbon dioxide into sugars. Right. So we would call those a photo autotroph. And that's just a kind of a fancy way of saying a light self-feeding organism. They can harness energy from light and they can make sugars to feed themselves. The microbes that live at the bottom of the ocean and do this without sunlight, they do the same thing, but they use chemicals and they use chemical energy, hydrogen sulfide and oxygen or other chemicals. We call them chemo autotrophs. So they're very similar to plants, except they're, they're doing this using chemical energy. So the cool part about this, Rich, is that these organisms Many of them don't need oxygen at all. In fact, they don't even like oxygen. It's toxic to them. It's, it's too aggressive an oxidant. And they make a living by harnessing the energy from chemicals. And this is cool because it's independent of the sun. And that raises the possibility that similar kinds of organisms could thrive elsewhere in our universe. Say, for example, the icy mm -hmm. moons of Saturn and Jupiter. Have you, um, so these, uh, these places where oil seeps through the floor of the ocean, what what are some of the conditions like? Like how deep and what's the oxygen level of the ambient water? And uh, you know, what are some of the conditions like the pressures? Yeah, the, you know, the funny thing about the deep sea is that it is um, defined as the ocean that's below a thousand meters deep. So it's about 3,000 feet thereabouts, right? So think about half a mile, ballpark. The deep ocean below a thousand meters does not ever experience sunlight. That's beyond the reach of the sun. That's what, how we use, that's how we define the deep ocean, right? So the moment you're down at a thousand meters, you actually have a lot of water over you. And it's, the pressure there is a hundred atmospheres. So we're used to living in one atmosphere, which is, let's just say, you know, for Americans is about 16 PSI. The pressure in your car tire is probably about two to three atmospheres, right? 32 to 48 PSI, somewhere in there. Well, the animals that live down at a hundred at a thousand meters are experiencing a hundred atmospheres of pressure or about 1,600 PSI. Most of the studies, the study sites that we work at are well below a thousand meters or at about 2000 meters. So there you're talking about over 3000 PSI to 4000 PSI, right? And it's perpetually dark. The water is typically near freezing, except from the hot water that could come out of vents. But at these methane seeps, it's ice cold. There's generally plenty of oxygen. That is not a big problem because it, it ends up coming from above and circulating into the deep ocean. There's about half as much in the deep ocean as there is at the surface. But where it gets really even more challenging, what, besides the pressure and the ice cold temperatures, is at the, at the methane seeps, the gas seeps, there's also a lot of sulfide produced by microbes in this case. And again, they're, that's, they're, it's so concentrated that it's toxic to a lot of animals. 
So the animals that live there are adapted to coping with that sulfide. And they have evolved over time to tolerate that sulfide because it's a great place to eat microbes. So if you're a grazer and you can evolve a tolerance to sulfide, you have access to a foodstuff that doesn't depend on the sun. And that's pretty cool. Well, what kind of uh, bacteria in those areas? What kind of uh, macroscopic creatures do you have? Do you have like certain shrimp or or other feeders that can uh, tolerate the sulfide? There are a lot of animals that live in and around seeps that have evolved to live in those conditions. We do find shrimp, for example, that go down and graze on these. There are fishes. Uh, There are lots of things called echinoderms. That means sea stars and um, sea cucumbers, uh, things like that. What's really cool, though, is recently we've observed that some fishes that live in and around the seeps may be commercially important species. Now, we're just at the beginning of this study and observation, but a few years back, Rich, we were doing dives off of Southern California, and we found an area of gas seepage that is 1.5 kilometers long and 300 meters wide. So to give you a rough idea, that's like about a dozen to 15 football fields or soccer fields. That's big. And it's one big continuous stretch of orange and yellow colored microbes. So we nicknamed it the Yellow Brick Road, in kind of homage to the Wizard of Oz, right? So these I, are like big curt, like orange curtains. Oh yeah. So absolutely rich. They look like um for the, those who remember the nineteen seventies, they look like the orange and yellow shag carpets that were so popular. I mean, that's yeah, what it looks like, right? Looks like a big old really a big old shag carpet, you know, just uh, a kind of orange and yellow, you know, throw rug that's 15 football fields big. Now, what's really cool is we started seeing some um, spotted sole, and that's a, uh, a particular kind of flatfish that we're swimming into and among these microbes. And we didn't really know what it meant. And my colleague, Lisa Levin, who's a professor at Scripps, uh, she and I were looking at these thinking, what in the world? Why are these fish swimming into here? Now, Lisa's an ecologist and thinks a lot about the micro, about the animals, rather, that live in and around these communities. But check this out. Why would a fish swim into a sulfitic toxic environment? Well, our best guess right now is that these fishes may be doing this to get rid of parasites. Now, if you lived in the ocean or if you lived out in the wild, you know, I mean, you, you could imagine that parasites, other critters want to live in or on or around you. We think these soul are swimming into these sulfitic waters and taking a few big gulps and pushing it through their gills, maybe to get rid of some of these parasites, which is cool because it's kind of like we go to a spa, you know, a detox spa to get rid of whatever, uh, our aches and pains and to cleanse ourselves. Well, these fish are going to a kind of tox spa to use the sulfide to probably get rid of these parasites. That's pretty cool. And it's relevant to... The, the $250 million fishing fishery industry off California. I guess it's better than Botoxing your face. They're uh, <laughs> in a more healthier way. You know, I think you're right. Way better than Botox. So that's kind of <laughs> cool. We're, we're starting to learn the relationship between these deep sea environments and the kind of ecosystem services they provide to huh. animals that live in the shallow waters, including commercially relevant fishes. Yeah, I was going to ask you, what if you map... Upwards from the seafloor above a seep, you know, at what point does the uh, the water not become toxic anymore? How does the uh, hydrogen sulfide disperse? You know, what does the zone look like? Is it a cone or a dome over the seep that's toxic, or is it going all the way to the surface? And you know, do fishes that normally don't live in that environment float, you know, swim through it? So, let me ask you all those things. Great question, Rich. The the sulfide that comes out of these seeps forms a kind of dome or a lens, I suppose, of water that's sulfitic. The thing about sulfide is it's really toxic, but when you put it in seawater with oxygen, it goes away pretty quickly. So um, it there isn't a whole bunch of sulfide, the toxic stuff, you know, say 100 meters off bottom, certainly not at a seep. But once you get near the bottom, definitely, you, you know, you get to within, say, five meters or about 15 feet or, or three meters or about nine feet. Oh, I bet you that that fishes and other animals start to experience it. But you, you raise an important question, Rich. We don't have a good idea yet of how matter and energy flow from the seafloor to the rest of the upper ocean. I mentioned earlier that we really focus on understanding how this matter and energy move through our biosphere from the deep sea to the shallow sea to our dinner plates. That is not something that we have really good a really good understanding of. So we think seeps are providing 
food for these animals that live on the bottom. They in turn may provide food for other animals that live higher in the water column and so on. Very likely to be the case, but we're just starting to figure it out. Yeah, would you say uh, the hydrogen sulfide goes away? It, what happens in the seep? Does the hydrogen sulfide break down and then fall back down into the floor of the seep? Like what's the cycling chemically going on? Yeah, great question. So hydrogen sulfide is one of these molecules that we describe as being really reactive. And it tends to react very quickly with oxygen, especially in the presence of, of you know, some of the trace metals we see in seawater. Now, it doesn't take a lot of iron or, or, or manganese or any other metals, but just a little bit, just the normal concentrations. And that sulfide reacts really fast with oxygen. And it forms a molecule called sulfate. Now, there's a lot of sulfate in the ocean, uh, 28 millimolar for those, uh, those who are inclined to get excited about these numbers. And the sulfide that comes out of the seep is usually a few millimolar. So it gets oxidized with oxygen and forms sulfate eventually. And, and sulfate's generally harmless at those concentrations to the animals in, in the ocean because they see it all the time. So that's what happens to the sulfide. Before all of it's oxidized, though, microbes have access to some of that hydrogen sulfide. And if they can bring it into their bodies and use their enzymes to oxidize it in a controlled manner, they can harness the energy from that reaction to produce ATP, just like you and I do from eating a hamburger or a veggie burger or whatever we eat. That's what they do by accessing hydrogen sulfide. That's their electron donor, to use the jargon, or it's their food. So have you sampled the seafloor near the seeps to see if there's a buildup of materials or, you know, again, looked at the, at the chemistry to see when, you know, the hydrogen sulfide becomes sulfate, sulfite, et cetera. Where does it go then? Does it get deposited to make its own structures or coral or? Oh yeah. Great question. Great question. Yeah. So Rich, a lot of the sulfide that uh, ends up coming out of seeps and vents um, will, will react to form solids. Now, Let's talk about vents for a second. Hydrothermal vents are areas of the seafloor where seawater has percolated into the crust into an aquifer, right? We're all comfortable with aquifers on land. Believe it or not, there's aquifers at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, why wouldn't there be? Seawater percolates into the crust, this basaltic crust, a kind of iron-rich mineral. It gets heated uh, by the, uh, a magma chamber, typically. That's a few kilometers down. And it gets cooked and chemically altered. And so once the water is chemically changed, all that sulfate in seawater becomes hydrogen sulfide. It's now warm and acidic, and it now floats to the surface through the path of least resistance, right? Through a crack in the crust. Uh, it floats, it, it comes up through a crack of the crust and emerges as a hydrothermal vent. That iron and sulfide rich water, when it hits the ice cold seawater, precipitates to form things called iron sulfides, which many people know as fool's gold. And it builds the big hydrothermal vent chimneys that you may have seen on documentaries. So a lot of that sulfide forms big deposits on the seafloor. And they're big, Rich. Some of these sulfides are 80 meters tall. That's taller than Notre Dame in Paris. I mean, these oh. are big structures. They're also of commercial interest these days, as people have learned that these sulfides are often enriched in gold or other metals, especially rare earth elements, things like tellurium or, or uh, any of the kind of lanthanides, as we call them. Those rare earth elements are really important in making uh, all the devices that we depend on and use today. So there's a growing conversation about whether or not we should mine these hydrothermal vent sulfide deposits, uh, because it would be a great source for these rare earth elements we use in electronics. So these seeps that you're talking about, are they punctuated by... Uh chimneys and black smokers or those in other parts of the, uh, you know, the seafloor. So hydrothermal vents on the seafloor are host to chimneys and black smokers and all those kinds of really dramatic features, right? Those structures that are taller than Notre Dame in Paris, just big, big things. And, or sometimes lots of little chimneys, you know, they look kind of like, um, maybe, uh, like a pot belly stove. You know, we see a lot of those around vents, the gas seeps, often don't have those features. They're usually, you know, a little more subdued there. But they're areas of the seafloor that we usually spot because there's a microbial mat or uh, like a microbial curtain or carpet sort of sitting above it. Usually a few centimeters or inches thick, but 
absolutely distinctive from the rest of the seafloor. That's how we typically know that there's a gas seep or methane coming out. Okay, okay. What, um, any other major features? I heard there's like uh, gigantic methane deposits. I don't know what form it's in, I forget, but they're laying on the floor in the ocean at certain spots. I mean, like, what other major features are there that you know of? There are parts of the seafloor that have gigantic deposits of something called methane ice or methane hydrates. Now, let me take a second and, and remind us all a bit about methane. Methane is a molecule that we talk a lot about because it's a potent greenhouse gas, much more potent than carbon dioxide. It doesn't persist as long in the atmosphere, but it's definitely worth paying attention to. We Methane comes out of oil and gas seeps, and you know we've talked a lot about as a society about natural gas and how it's a cleaner fuel than oil. And there's truth in that, but the methane we get out of oil and gas uh, seeps and and natural gas uh, wells is old methane. It's methane that was produced a long time ago. And when we burn it, we're exacerbating our atmospheric carbon dioxide problem. But get this rich. There are microbes, uh, many, many microbes that make so much methane from new carbon, from living carbon, biomethane, to be uh, to use the jargon, that would technically be kind of more carbon neutral. And most of that methane is made in the seafloor. Rich, there's so much methane that's produced in the seafloor that uh, you know it really could play a role in meeting humankind's energy needs. The fact of the matter is, though, it's really hard to access and probably not a good idea, in my opinion. But that methane on the seafloor is produced so quickly and rapidly that at the conditions on the seafloor, it forms a kind of methane ice. And it looks like the ice you would put in your glass, except if you took a match to it, it burns as it releases the methane. And there's an awful lot down there. And nations have been seriously considering whether or not we should be mining that as well. But as a deep sea scientist, I would say that the, the costs decidedly outweigh the benefits when it comes to methane hydrates. So. I've heard about mapping the seafloor, but I've only thought about it in terms of topology. You know, yep. Oh, here's the deepest part. Here's the mountains, et cetera. Is anyone mapping the seafloor? And can you somehow remotely to see, oh, here's methane hydrates. Here's, um, you know, these, these vents. Here are seeps. If you did that, you know, even on a small scale, then on a larger scale, you might see like a very different picture of the seed. You might uncover the dynamics of it by seeing all that. Rich, I think it's really critical that we spend a little bit more time and effort than we have on really developing good maps of the seafloor. You know, the expedition of Sacagawea and Lewis and Clark changed the way that Americans viewed the continental, uh, the continent of North America. Right now, we have maps of the seafloor that come from satellites, but they, they have the, about the resolution of a, of, a, of a city block or two. So that means if there were something the size of a house on the seafloor, you, you wouldn't know it was there. Uh, in fact, some of these maps have mountains where there are no mountains and have flat areas where there are mountains. So they're not really high resolution. We do have the tools, though, to go down and make higher resolution maps from ships and from underwater robotic submarines that will do precisely what you alluded to further our understanding of the dynamics of the seafloor and its relationship to the upper ocean and, frankly, to our entire biosphere. Now, we do have tools that can actually map these methane hydrates and map the hydrothermal vents. And interestingly, we have become, as a society, more interested in and committed to making these maps, I think in part because of the awareness that they may be commercially valuable. And I'm okay with us making these maps and asking the question, you know, are, uh, should we or shouldn't we mine these? That's a question for society writ large. But I'm also glad that we make these maps and do deep sea surveys to see the ecosystems and to understand the microbes and frankly, understand the role in the rest of our biosphere. If you just do maps, Rich, and you're like, oh, here's a big metal deposit and you go mine it and do it blindly, you may be causing far more problems for those ecosystems and even humankind than you realize. So we got to do this right. well, make the maps and do our biosurveys. Yeah, it's weird. I'm picturing the ocean as like a, a sandwich now, and the bottom bread is these, uh, you know, methane hydrates and seeps and all the other stuff. And there's activity in the top bread is, you know, the top X number of meters where there's sunlight and, you know, plankton and all the other stuff. And in the middle, I guess that's maybe the, the quieter part. I don't know. But the, the top and the bottom 
modulate a lot of what uh, what goes on in the sea, I guess. You know, I mean, it is it is a kind of sandwich ocean, isn't it? You have this very dynamic sea floor, right? That that we know from plate tectonics now is being recreated and and consumed all the time. I mean, the sea floor grows at about the same rate that your fingernails do, if not a little bit faster. How's that for crazy? So literally, the entire sea floor is moving now. The upper ocean is very familiar to us. We see waves and storms and, and you know, pelicans and swordfish and commercial fisheries and cruise ships, all sorts of activities, including human activities, right? A huge amount of our world's commerce takes place on, on the open ocean and on the high seas. The rest of the ocean in between is Earth's largest habitat. The deep sea is the largest biosphere on Earth. It's about 80% of our planet's living space. And there's a lot of action that goes on there, Rich. But it's so big and so vast that it's spread out. So, so think of it as as um, the challenge being like, how do you measure these really big processes that are taking place in this giant ocean when the signal you're looking for, right? It's, say it's let's pretend it's the amount of nutrients that come from the deep sea is spread out so widely that it's like it's really dilute. It's still huge. It's just really hard to measure. And we're not good at that. That's why we miss a lot of the importance of this open blue water. It's just hard to make those measurements, but it doesn't make them any less significant. Not at all. So how big of a picture do you look at or consider when you're considering these seeps and you're considering the ocean and the ecology of it? Do you, are you zooming in and out all the time and looking at, I don't want to call them micro environments, but local environments and then the whole environment, local and whole. And again, what, what levels do you have to model and think and play and, and, and look in order to understand what you want to understand? You know, studying the natural world around us has to take place at, at different spatial and temporal scales. In other words, we, we need scientists who are willing to devote their lives to studying a particular species of algae. We also need scientists who are uh, willing to look at the ocean through the lens of a satellite and and try and understand processes at that scale. And neither is more important than the other. Neither one is more important than the other. My lab is really interested in connecting the dots between some of these scales. And we don't quite go to the scale of satellites, but what we really care about is asking how do microbes, which are kind of micron in size, influence their local environment on the order of meters and tens of meters? And what is the connection between these areas that are tens of meters wide to other related environments that may be a few kilometers away? And collectively, how do those environments influence the upper ocean, which is tens and hundreds of kilometers? Now, most of our work is on that sort of microns to meters to kilometer range. But Rich, the, when we start looking at these ecosystems on the seafloor and starting to study matter and energy flow through it, which is really best described as biogeochemistry, we start to find that deep sea vents and seeps are really important to the rest of our ocean. I'll give you an example. Colleagues of mine not too long ago found that iron that comes out of deep sea hydrothermal vents in the deep, deep ocean of the Pacific have an influence on the productivity of the waters off of Chile which is one of the most productive waters uh, in, in our world and a hotbed for commercial fishing. So again, these events are kind of like the ocean's multivitamin, right? They're providing the trace metals needed for the plankton in the upper ocean to grow. Those plankton in turn are fed on by tiny shrimps, which in turn feed the bigger shrimps and thus goes the, the food web. That rich is what we do. I want to connect the dots so that humankind better understands the relationships between different parts of our world, in particular the ocean. That's my focus. Yeah, that's why it seems like there needs to be this this mapping because I don't know. I don't know what would it tell you if there were um, on average, you know, one seep for every uh, you know ten miles in the ocean versus one seep for every you know mile or a hundred miles or what if there was these kind of features that were you know heavily present in these parts of the ocean and then these parts of the ocean were barren and then you could um, correlate that with the richness and the movement of fish and etc rich that's a great question you're gonna uh you're gonna make me want to drag you into ocean science you know you're talking about one of our biggest problems uh what uh what does it matter if there's a or how does it matter if there's a seep one one seep every kilometer versus 10 seeps every kilometer right those are the kinds of information that we're lacking. 
And what I can do, and many others can do, we do this well as a society and as a group of scientists, we can go down and study that seep and make some chemical measurements and say, this is what's coming out of this seep. But we don't really, at this point, without a map, really an honest map of their distribution, we don't really know how many there are. And thus, we're flying blind on what their impact is, right? And and again, going back to Sacagawea and Lewis and Clark, you know, imagine they they went on their expedition and... Um, came back and they said, oh, there's lots of cool stuff. You know, we came across Yellowstone and mountain ranges and what have you. And, um, but we had no idea where, I mean, that would be a little bit more information, but then we'd still be stuck wondering where exactly these features are. And that's about where we're at in ocean sciences and, and we're getting better. Don't misunderstand me, but we have a long way to go to having a really good uh, base map that allows us to build on. Well, where is there a place that, um, seems to have a lot of diversity in terms of features that you can map, you know, to a very, very high degree to a, you know, to a one foot resolution. Is there an area that you could designate like that, map the heck out of it, look for cycling horizontally and vertically and, and try to make a model of this, this one area? Rich, that's a great question. Where in the ocean would we be able to do a really good integrative job of mapping at the appropriate resolution and, 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 making these sort of linkages between the seafloor and the water column. We've identified a few sites already in the United States, Canada, Japan, Germany, and France, and and other nations, frankly, have invested in ocean observatories where we put down um, infrastructure and sometimes telecommunications and power cables to build an observatory, a suite of sensors that can make the kind of chemical measurements and observations you're talking about. And that's fine. Uh, And we learn a lot. I think that the problem is we are still trying to extrapolate an understanding of the ocean from a few representative sites that we've studied. There's a bit of a bias in this, Rich. Most of these sites were chosen because we knew something about them. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily representative of the seafloor. So I think uh, that work is important. You spot on, right? We got to do this and we have some good examples now. And we're just starting to make that kind of integrated measurement that you're referring to. We still need to go and really build a better base map for the entire ocean. And I would say the way to do this is to focus on the exclusive economic zones of all nations. There is every reason in the world that wealthier nations should be investing in the mapping uh, of, 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 of actually enabling other nations to create their own maps and allowing those nations to own those maps. There's, the ocean does not belong to anyone, but we all depend on it. So the more we understand about it, uh, frankly, the better off humankind will be. Well, what if you looked at some of the great circulating ocean currents and you sampled them for composition and you, you know, you, you ran along with like, I don't know, one of these great circulating currents. I don't know at what depth, but again, kept sampling and sampling as it goes. Maybe that would be a, um, an easy way to get a quick tour of what it had passed by and what it was influenced by. Yeah, Rich, the, the, there are a couple of efforts now where people are going out and mapping the, the the great ocean currents, both with an eye towards understanding its chemistry as well as its biology. And so there's some really amazing efforts worldwide to look at uh, microbial communities in the ocean, uh, biogeochemical transformations, and so on. And that's fantastic. It really is. And I have many amazing colleagues who work in the upper ocean in the water column who are doing wonderful work in that regard. You mentioned this idea of a sandwich ocean. I think that's a great way to think about it. We have some amazing work happening in the upper ocean to really start to uh, connect the dots between biology and chemistry and physics. And we have some good work starting to happen now on the seafloor. Some great work, in fact, just like in the upper ocean. Connecting them through the middle, though, that's probably our next grand challenge. And that's a, that's a formidable one. Well, very good. What do you think is going to be the near-term future insights that you're headed towards? Ocean science is been really reshaped by advances in molecular biology, the genomics revolution, which really began maybe about 20 to 25 years ago now, has fundamentally changed the way we think about marine microbes. There is no doubt. Advances in um, physical and chemical oceanography have also occurred that have been led by new technologies that allow us to do things we couldn't do. That also includes robotics, right? We have fleets of robotic vehicles now that that people have access to for higher resolution mapping and understanding of the physics and chemistry of the ocean. So cool, right? I think one big area 
of many, but one that's important to me is, is I'd love to see us talk about changing the way we go about engagement and inclusion in ocean science. Ocean science is kind of grown out of Navy research, at least it has in the United States. And as a consequence, some of the culture has, uh, um, hasn't changed in about 50, 60, 70, 80, 100 years. I think we have an opportunity to reimagine ocean science that is much more outward looking, that engages actively scientists from around the world and engages people and other stakeholders, right? Just besides we scientists. Let me give you a specific example, Rich. Um, in the United States, a lot of our research is very expeditionary in nature. I write a grant, NSF gives me some money. Uh, we go to Fiji and we get permission from the Fijian government to work in their waters, right? Or Tonga or wherever. Once we get there, we take aboard uh, a person of that nation, a citizen of Fiji or Tonga or wherever, and they kind of participate in our work. You see, I think that what we've done in that case is we've spent a lot of money on paying for diesel to move a ship across the ocean to do work that will probably end up in U.S. research labs and advancing U.S. interests. And at the same time, we could have used the, those same or even fewer resources to do better work led by uh, local scientists. Why does this matter? Because it's a big darn ocean. And the way we do our work now takes our resources, which are always limited, and really focuses them on particular targets that, that are uh, in the interest of U.S. scientists. We got to do better. And I think advancing the engagement of stakeholders who can make scientific measurements uh, as amateur scientists, and I mean that in the true sense of the word amateur, right? People who do it for love. Um, figuring out how to support scientists around the world so that we can get a more comprehensive view of the ocean and its connectivity. That, to me, is what I see as the future of excellent ocean science. Uh, and I see no reason why we shouldn't take that seriously and try and get there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If you were to propose, um, I don't know if you can call it surveillance, but uh, if you were to propose funding local people in some place, you know, let's say Fiji, to yep. do ongoing surveillance or you know, measurements or whatever of their, their waters, do you think that would be supported by a, a U.S. grant agency? One of the obstacles to this idea of global global ocean science and collaboration is that federal agencies are typically restricted by law to support uh, their own um, national interests. I can't take grant money from the National Science Foundation and use it to support science in another nation. I can pay for a scientist travel. I can pay for collaboration, but I can't pay for their science. I think that we owe it to ourselves to give this a bit of thought and to ask, how is it that our interests globally are shared. And if there's anything that physically and literally connects us all, it's the ocean. And so finding a practical model where we realize that supporting science in other nations is actually in our best interest as well as their best interest is a wise way to proceed. So there are some administrative and bureaucratic impediments, Rich. I don't think they are insurmountable. I think we need to start having the conversation now about why it is of value to the United States and the global community to empower scientists and other nations to do work, to own their work. This isn't a colonial approach. This is let us help you do the work you need to empower you to manage and, and oversee your own communities. And it benefits everybody. So what's, um, I don't know, what big questions do you think that you may be able to answer in the near term? because of your research? I think that a lot of what our research has been pointing us to is the recognition that processes in the deep ocean are intricately and deeply tied uh, to processes in the surface ocean, which we in turn know are tied to processes on land. So Rich, what, what, what I think we will be doing over the years is connecting the dots between how deep sea vents or seeps are made and how long they persist, connecting the dots between that and the food that ends up on your dinner plate. And the moment we get to the point where we have at least a better understanding and hopefully a really good understanding of those relationships, the way humankind thinks about its interaction with the world, I think will change. I hope to see us get beyond the feeling that we are removed from our biosphere. 
and that we start think, realizing that we, we are intimately tied to the rest of the world. Because at the end of the day, even the most selfish human-centric person who doesn't care about a single deep sea creature, that's fine by me, fine. But don't think for a moment that it doesn't affect your, your well-being and your health. So everyone from the most human-centric person to the most ardent deep sea fish lover should recognize that an investment in our ocean is an, an investment in earth, and that includes humankind. Well, very good. Peter, it's been a good call and you know, we're out of time. What's the best way for people to find out more you know, from uh, your work and about your work? Well, a lot of the work that we've done, uh, we, we have some highlight stuff on our, on our website. Uh, also, I would say there are some great resources that people should turn to. The Ocean Exploration Trust, Schmidt Ocean Institute, uh, NASA Ocean Sciences, uh, NSF Ocean Sciences. There's a lot out there where people can learn about this work and more importantly, learn how to be engaged. Uh, we need your help. So I'm looking forward to uh, hearing from you all and uh, hopefully a chance to meet some of you. Great, Peter. Thanks for coming on the podcast. I appreciate it. Pleasure is mine, Rich. Be well. Thanks for the invitation. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.